Outer space, or the final frontier, is the most fascinating wonder filled with endless possibilities. In our brief history, though, there have only been about 600 of us that have actually traveled to outer space. It's incredibly expensive, time-consuming, and dangerous, but at the same time, absolutely necessary, so we can have a greater understanding of our universe. Out of the tens of thousands of applicants who applied for the NASA Space Shuttle Program between 1972 to 2011, a very select few were actually chosen as astronauts. Perhaps one of the most fascinating stories begins with a little girl who grew up in the small farm town of Jackson, Missouri. It was there where Dr. Linda Godwin first excelled in math and science. And after high school, she would go on to Southeast Missouri State University and eventually the University of Missouri where she would receive a PhD in physics. Godwin would eventually join NASA in 1980 and would travel to space four times. While filming at the University of Missouri, where she currently teaches, Godwin told me that the space shuttle missions gave people something to dream and hope for. It's an optimistic endeavor that makes people think of the future in a very positive way, and that we as the human race can and will explore space. From a small town Midwesterner to the fourth woman to walk in space, Dr. Linda Godwin shares her story. My name is Linda Godwin. I um, am a Navy native of Missouri. I grew up outside of Jackson, Missouri. Got all my education in Missouri, Southeast Missouri State in, in physics and math, and then PhD in physics at the University of Missouri. Then I went to work for NASA for 30 years in Houston, Texas. For um, 25 out of those 30 years, I was in the astronaut program. That career at NASA enabled me to be able to come back to the University of Missouri, where I'm now a professor in the Department of Physics and Astronomy, getting to bring some of that experience back to the students here that I work with. The countdown for launch has been progressing for a few days. The crew has been in quarantine for a week. Part of the time in Houston, Texas, and then transferring flying to Kennedy Space Center and staying in crew quarters. Um, there's an official wake up in the crew quarters there, and, and the crew will have probably sleep shifted a little bit so that their circadian rhythm is in sync with whatever the mission requirements are. Um, there are early morning weather briefings or status briefings on uh, whether anything has changed in the vehicle status. There's breakfast. And if it's an afternoon, if it's in the crew day, an afternoon launch, there could be a few hours of free time. But if not, if it's a morning launch, then things would proceed fairly rapidly to the suit preparation room after that. And eventually, when the crew all had on their orange suits and everything was checked and all the gear was ready, they'd walk out to the van and ride out to the launch pad. And you'd take the elevator up to the correct level and then wait, one, one would wait their turn as a crew member to be strapped in. Eventually, the closeout crew would close the hatch on the shuttle, you know, would uh, pull back the arm that was deployed against the hatch. Everybody would exit the pad and go a couple, two or three miles away and wait. T-minus 20 seconds. T minus 15 seconds. The sound suppression water system has been activated. We have a go for main engine start. getting up to the flight deck and looking out the overhead windows which were usually pointed toward the ground at that point and just seeing Earth for the first time. I mean that was one of the most awesome things.
certainly floating is an odd thing and it took some getting used to um, just living in that environment since the effects of gravity here are not felt you know, there doesn't seem to be an up and a down but the fact the shuttle has things that have labels and letters and we've seen it in simulators I found that our brains want an up and a down There were multiple assignments for every crew member, so I'll just kind of hit like the, the top one or two. Uh, on my first flight, I was designated uh, the lead robotic arm operator. Using the robotic arm, that was my job, to move it around, grapple it, uh, carefully move it up, position it above the shuttle while we did certain checkouts. Uh, I had to fix an antenna and do some things. I had two crewmates to, to fix a high gain antenna that was snagged, and then at the end, to open the snares, and as the shuttle carefully backed away, we left that craft in orbit for nine years, looking at high energy uh, electromagnetic radiation coming from all galaxies and inside our own and everything else. But my second flight was an Earth science mission. We had an imaging radar, microwave size radiation. It was bouncing off the surface of the Earth being re and coming back up to the antenna on the shuttle. It was really just looking at the surface of our planet and looking at deforestation, um, looking at the deserts, looking at the oceans. And we had another suite of instruments that was looking at Earth's atmosphere, so it was Earth science. My third flight, our primary goal was to dock with the Mir space station, and we brought a crew, NASA crew member up to, to spend several months on board. Um, so that was the primary objective of the mission, but another major objective is we had a small science laboratory in the back full of experiments from the European Space Agency. And I was one of the two crew members that we spent many hours back there working in that, that small uh, module, um, working on those experiments. And my last flight to the International Space Station, it was a, uh, we took up three new crew members. We brought three crew members home. We took up a lot of supplies, science, um, other resources for the crew that was there. I was the load master, I guess I'd call it for that flight, in charge of making sure everything got unloaded, checked off. And I got to use a robotic arm on this one again too to transfer that from the shuttle and attach it to the space station. And then we opened the hatch and we unloaded it. And we had to reload it with things that were coming home with us. And it really mattered where we put everything because the whole center of gravity on the shuttle coming back affects its landing. So load master on that. Um, also did a spacewalk on the last couple of flights. So those are just some of the highlights. So deorbit burn and coming back home in a nutshell means we have to get out of this free fall orbit where we've just been going around the Earth and missing it and slow down just enough so they could use, so we could use energy management to bleed the rest of our speed off using the friction of the atmosphere to land just where we wanted to land in our big glider called the space shuttle that now is transforming from an orbital vehicle into an entry vehicle. Mars, you know, is in the sights and it's on somebody's schedule. I, that would be a huge challenge. While technically we could do it, there are a lot of challenges. And it's the price tag, frankly, and the politics that really make that one kind of maybe a tough one to, to get on the schedule. But I think we will do it. I don't know if I'll see it, but I hope I do. The shuttle missions, you know, along with the other space programs, and certainly Apollo, you know, going to the moon before that, I think it gave people something to um, dream, you know, dream for, hope for. Uh, it, it's an optimistic, you know, Endeavor. I think it makes people think about the future in very positive ways that we can do this and you know that we keep improving our technology, we keep improving what we can do. Um, it, it's, it's a prestigious um, thing I think around the world. There are many countries want to be players in space these days because it's seen as um, something that, that gives our country a lot of credibility and that's why I want to see us remain on you know, very competitive on the space exploration stage around the world. Oh uh, wow, you know my whole career at NASA, that whole 30 years was a huge impact on my life, just being there and 
you know, I guess it changed my perspective of the world a bit. When you can go around it in 90 minutes, like we did in this low Earth orbit, and you see the different countries and the different people and all the, you know, the oceans and everything. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's the only planet we have and we need to take care of it. And I already thought that, but I think that really drove it home. You know, in, in another way that I didn't really anticipate in the beginning when I just really, really wanted to be an astronaut, uh, having had that experience has opened up a lot of doors for people, for travels I've gotten to do, places I've gotten to go, and people I've gotten to meet. So it really has influenced a lot of my life.